Okay, so I'm really making this video as a way to say thank you because something really quite special has just happened, which is that my little channel has just hit 1 million views, okay? So I know that this is the kind of thing that happens during a week for some of the larger channels on YouTube, but for me, this is the culmination of many years of making YouTube videos. And I haven't been making content to try to gain a great big follower base. I've really just been making videos on topics that interest me. And over the years, it's just been such a wonderful thing to have the kind of support of people watching YouTube. And so I just wanted to say a sort of heartfelt thank you to everyone who's watched and supported this channel over the years, because it's really meant an enormous amount to me that I can talk about my interests, I can make videos to explain things that I'm sort of trying to understand myself and all the rest of it, and that there are people out there that are sort of interested in these rather technical topics, and so thank you, okay? And so rather than doing my normal kind of approach of doing a video talking about some very specific kind of math topic, what I thought I'd do today is to talk about something more general, and that is my favorite maths books, okay? So I'm 36 years old. I've spent about half of my life um, being fairly concentrated on mathematics, either in education or in jobs. And so I thought what I'd do is go over some of my favorite kind of maths books that I've encountered during the years on different subjects and explain what I think so great about them. So the first one I'll pick is this book here. This is Mathematical Carnival by Martin Gardner. So this is a book that was lent to me by my brother when I was a kid and it's full of puzzles and interesting kinds of descriptions of things that people don't know in mathematics. It's written by a philosopher. There's not an enormous amount of notation. It's very kind of easy to read, but it really shows all these interesting connections between mathematics and the real world and has some very, very interesting kinds of puzzles in it. So when I was growing up, I think I'm maybe sort of partially dyslexic or something. I certainly didn't have a very easy time reading when I was a kid. And so I really appreciate the kind of small chapters and the fact that one can very quickly find out puzzles to think about in books like this that you can really, you know, entertain yourself thinking about. And also um, there's a lot of contact with the kind of unsolved problems in mathematics, which is something which I've always thought is one of the most interesting kind of aspects to maths is that you're never very far away from some kind of a topic which nobody understands. Maybe you could be the first person to understand that kind of thing. Okay, so I was fortunate enough to get into university to study theoretical physics. So, okay, I was fortunate enough to get into university to study theoretical physics. And one of the kind of most eye-opening books which I got is this book here, Engineering Mathematics. We had to study this as part of a degree. It's by K.A. Stroud. Now, a lot of the books I'm sort of going through here are more on the sort of pop math side, the kind of easy to read, motivating kind of books, which I think are actually the most important type for people beginning mathematics. I think it's much more important to be motivated to know the lay of the land than it is to sort of roll one's sleeves up and actually work through a big textbook like this. But saying that, this really did wonders for me in helping me to understand things um, which we were supposed to have done earlier at school. But to be quite honest, Although there's obviously a lot of great stuff in school level mathematics, there are definitely things that I have issues with. I don't think people should be teaching 
things like sine and cosine functions. Um, I think calculus is taught in a far too sort of mysterious way when you're too young to uh, be exposed to things like limits and things. And this book really did wonders for me to sort of help to explain those different things. And it just like Stroud just writes so wonderfully like this book is just filled with lots and lots and lots of problems to work through and unlike a lot of maths writers who are sort of much more like definition theorem proof definition theorem proof Stroud's not like that he explains all of these ideas through lots of examples kind of gradually and for someone who's just beginning out in mathematics it's really great and it'll give you a kind of handle on all sorts of interesting topics like vector calculus and complex numbers and lots of very useful things for doing applied mathematics. So during the course of doing this physics degree, I started to sort of realise that a lot of the things that I was most interested in, which is like things to do with the nature of space, the nature of time, these are really things which mathematicians have a lot easier time kind of getting at because really the type of tools that one really wants to be able to understand those kind of things are taught more in mathematics departments than they are in physics departments. And so I started to get more and more interested in kind of more pure mathematical topics and I would often be found going off to the local bookshop, which was uh, Borders Bookshop back in those days. I think it's it's closed down now. Um, but I'd often go and pick up kind of pop maths books and they really meant a lot to me. So I think this is to recommend a book to the man on the street um, on mathematics. It would definitely be this book. It's a pop maths book. It's easy to read, but it's absolutely beautiful. Mario Olivio's book, the golden ratio. So this is about a particular number called the golden ratio. But if you look at the book, I mean, it has so many connections with ideas of art and nature and history and physics and geometry and number theory and pretty much, like you know, just so much and so much beauty in this book. And also it's kind of tied in with this idea of the golden ratio, which really relates to some of the most kind of deep and profound ideas um, in things like theoretical physics. I mean, there's no doubt that this number, the golden ratio, has lots of mysterious aspects and is very kind of closely woven in with the nature of reality. And the fact that this book exposes so much about it and also teaches you about how to think about geometry, how to think about numbers, easy to think about things like Fibonacci numbers and very interesting things like the geometry of the Pentagon. There's just so much to this book and it's just a pop maths book. So, you know, it's the kind of thing you can read on the train. Very, very wonderful book is this. Um, so that was one of the books that really opened my eyes to how rich mathematics was. And then another book, which I was also reading as an undergraduate, is this one here, Recreations in the Theory of Numbers. And like I was saying before, I think that an awareness of unsolved problems in mathematics, I think this is such a great thing when you're beginning, when you're first starting out, that this idea that, you know, it hasn't all been done, that you know the professor at the back of the room doesn't know everything that there are things in mathematics for example you know what is the nature of the prime numbers what's the order of the sequence what's the kind of pattern there these kind of questions no one knows nobody knows people have studied these kind of things for thousands of years and this is such a great book for conveying that kind of aspect of things i mean even on the very first page you have a list of problems to do with basic number theory, the kind of thing that you can wrap your mind around after school level mathematics, but some of these problems are completely unsolved. Okay, so immediately you like this one, prove that every even number can be expressed 
as the sum of two primes. Nobody knows how to do that. Well, I think it's every even number bigger than four, but nobody knows how to do that. They, it's just an unsolved problem in mathematics. Um, and there's so many of these, but this book isn't just about the unknown. It explains a lot of very beautiful ideas from number theory, the kind of things you can appreciate um, without needing much kind of mathematical education, but also it, the kind of problems that, you know, you can just be sort of sat somewhere with nothing to do and you can easily recall and start working on these number theory problems because it's the kind of thing which is very sort of easy to think about. There's not many prerequisites there. So this is a really great book, Recreations in the Theory of Numbers. Um, so anyway, like I say, when I was doing this physics degree, I got more interested in mathematics. I ended up doing a master's in mathematics. And um, towards the end of that course, we had to write a dissertation. We had to pick something to focus on. And that's when I discovered this book, which is Small Worlds by Duncan Watts, which is a book which I don't seem to have anymore. I'm not sure what happened to it, but it's another book that really opened my eyes um, to a lot of things. So this is really more on the kind of applied math side. And this book, Small Worlds, is really about how sort of graph theory and network science is revealing kind of things about the structure of these large scale networks in the world. So things like social networks, the internet, the kind of nervous system of different creatures, um, electrical networks, how many of these kind of structures have similarity and what kinds of network kind of structures these things have and what kind of tools people can use to model them and what kind of models people have. And all of these kind of networky questions are explored in this book, uh, Small Worlds. And I found this so inspiring because I think that graph theory is one of the easiest and kind of nicest areas of mathematics to get involved with. It's so easy to start. And there's so much kind of low hanging fruit. There's so many ways that you can use graph theory novelly to model things or to you know, make some kind of new mathematical system that no one's ever thought of before. And then the fact that you can connect it with all this real world data is so interesting, especially at this time, this was really at the beginning of this kind of data science revolution, which we're still really in the middle of. And it was just so interesting to read this book. Um, anyway, I progressed from my master's. I ended up doing a PhD. Uh, I was really researching a combination of graph theory and game theory. And those were very, very good years. Um, I always found it very interesting and exciting to be doing original research. And during that time, I discovered a lot of interesting books, but I'll just point out one, uh, which is a good one, which is Concepts of Modern Mathematics by Ian Stewart. Okay, so Ian Stewart is another great popularizer of mathematics. And you know, most of his books are pop maths books, which are great, but this is something between a kind of pop maths book and a textbook. And he really goes through most of the areas you'd see in a kind of maths degree and just briefly mentions what those different subjects are about. And um, it's really wonderful to see this book and to you know, get some basic understanding of ideas from kind of set theory and topology and group theory. And just to get that kind of surface level understanding of the basic definitions and the basic ideas of these subjects is just so useful. Okay, so that's another one I'd recommend. I mean, I, I think there's mainly, so I think there's roughly speaking two kind of functions of a maths book. One of them is to sort of, one of them is to sort of um, actually teach you some big theory, something like a textbook, and the other one is to motivate. And I think actually it's probably more important to have books to motivate you to do things rather than, you know, these big textbooks to slog through. 
But as far as those kind of more things on the textbook side go, I would definitely recommend the concepts of modern mathematics. I think somebody who has the motivation already get stuck into that after you finish school level mathematics and that will you know immediately kind of boost you up to a very kind of high level in mathematics um, and then you can start on category theory okay that would be the kind of shortcut I would say if I could do it all over again that would be the route I would take um, but saying that you know one often needs to sort of wander around a lot and try out lots of new things in order to find what's the right path. Um, so I'll carry on with my list of good books. So after I finished my PhD, um, I was lucky enough to be invited to stay an extra year by my supervisor as a postdoc. And that's when I started to get really interested in the work of this guy, okay, Stephen Wolfram. He wrote this book called A New Kind of Science. And I remember when I discovered this book, being so excited, um, words couldn't really express because it's just such a breath of fresh air. I mean, just have a look inside of this book. It's just full of pictures and words. There are very few equations and Stephen Wolfram really writes in a way which is really different to most kind of textbooks that you'll find and quite refreshing actually. But more than that, the actual ideas in this book are just absolutely, they're really very different and very interesting. Um, so the basic ideas then, um, well, let me just tell you a couple of things about Stephen Wolfram. Uh, one of them is that he's, you know, one of the kind of great intellects of our age, he developed um, this Mathematica software program and he, you know, he um, at a very early age, he was already very active in theoretical physics. Um, and then he spent about 10 years where he sort of dropped out of the mainstream and basically shut himself off and wrote this book, A New Kind of Science. And it's really a very sort of original take on certain things that he discovered um, which relate to computer programs. Okay, so what's the basic idea? The basic idea is that you look at how simple programs run, okay? Not programs that you've selected necessarily, but say simple programs chosen at random. You run them, you look at what behavior they have. This is the idea of Stephen Wolfram's new kind of science. So if you make these kind of programs that you can easily sort of make pictures of like this, and you just picture all the different behaviors that they do, you quickly find that there are lots of these programs that have really immensely complex, interesting and useful behavior. And suddenly one finds that one's in a sort of computational uh, naturalist kind of viewpoint where it's sort of a bit like zoology. You're trying to classify the behavior of all of these strange kind of beasts living out there in the computational landscape and trying to find uses of them, a bit like kind of frontier explorers um, trying to find uses for natural resources and things. Um, and so it's really a very interesting kind of thing to learn about. And I mean, Wolfram in his book applies these simple programs to different things in biology and fluid dynamics and uh, theoretical physics and so on. And I was very inspired by this. I did a couple of research projects on um, string rewrite systems and network rewrite systems, sort of partially, it's a kind of empirical exploration of how these programs run, just sort of seeing how they run, what kind of patterns they make, classifying what you see. Then there's the aspect to them, which is like actually trying to mathematically study how some of these behaviors work, which is very interesting when you have highly complex behavior. And also the most kind of interesting um, aspect to it, or one of them, which is actually trying to find comp trying to find technological applications to some of these kind of things that one can see. So I think, for example, 3D printing, um, different kinds of artistically interesting patterns generated by simple programs is an interesting kind of frontier 
for this type of work. Anyway, uh, all that said, um, after I did my postdoc, I ended up uh, moving to Hong Kong where I did information engineering. I did another postdoc there. I was combining game theory and graph theory for wireless spectrum allocation sort of research. So that was good fun. But I was sort of hankering after the old days of doing pure maths. And I was very fortunate to find this book at the local bookshop, Metamath by Gregory Chaitin. So this is really a very nice read. Uh, Chaitin has a lot of respect for undecidability for the work of Godal and Turin. Um, and he also has done quite a lot to reveal these kind of areas that mathematics can't really shed any light on. So it's, it's very interesting from a sort of philosophical viewpoint to notice that there are these kind of areas which basically can't be understood by mathematics, okay, you kind of undecidability and how one sort of can be aware of that. It's extremely interesting. Now, um, another great thing about this book is that um, Chaitin points the way to a lovely kind of programming language called Lisp, which is a functional programming language. And um, that had an impact on me sort of many years later. It ended up leading me towards category theory, which is another great thing. So after a few years of doing that research job in Hong Kong, I ended up getting a job as an assistant professor in theoretical computer science. Um, and and um, it turned out that that job and that kind of place where I had to go to do that, it wasn't really that suitable for me. So I ended up leaving that job quite shortly afterwards. And, in, to be honest, in some ways, it was a kind of difficult time, but there was a few things that helped me to kind of get through that period more easily. And one of them was discovering the kind of beautiful area of projective geometry. And this book by Olivier Witcher um, on projective geometry is really, really beautiful. And also, I mean, it's not a book which is filled with kind of algebraic equations and things like that. All you really need to follow this book is some paper, a pencil and a ruler. OK, um, and projective geometry is just such an interesting and kind of appealing subject, especially for those people that don't want to get really bogged down with algebra to kind of reconnect with the kind of geometric aspect of mathematics, which is, you know, something which I don't think is present enough in the kind of modern curriculum. I would like to change the way mathematics is taught at schools, drop out some of the kind of trigonometry using algebra and stuff and put in more of a kind of old style uh, constructions with uh, straight edge um, or maybe straight edge and compass constructions. Anyway, um, time went on. I and the most recent job I've ended up doing was working on kind of theoretical ecology using partial differential equations to model populations of fish. So this was really quite a computer intensive kind of. So this was really kind of quite a computer intensive kind of project. And I mean, there's a lot of maths in it, but it's more towards the sort of applied side. So at this time, I started to have another hankering for kind of getting back to more kind of pure maths and also getting towards kind of more elegant types of programming. Um, and so I got more interested in things like functional programming and Haskell. And then I was very, very fortunate to discover the work of Bartosz Malewski and his introduction to category theory category theory for programmers. So this resource I only discovered quite recently, and I'd say it had an extremely profound impact on my mathematical development. I mean, when I discovered category theory, I had a sort of um, mixed reaction. I was on one part completely blown away by the kind of beauty of it and just absolutely enthused to study it. On the other hand, 
I actually felt kind of angry. I felt kind of angry that I'd spent um, about eight years studying mathematics intensely and never come across the subject of category theory, which really answered so many of the kind of questions that I had about foundational aspects in maths. I mean, all of these kind of connections between different concepts that I've encountered all became apparent so quickly when I started studying category theory. And I quickly realized that this was the subject that I'd have to spend the rest of my life uh, studying because it just provided more insights than all of the rest of the things I'd ever looked at combined. And it's really Bartosz Malowski's work in you know, making this book category theory for programmers and the different resources he's made, which made this possible because a lot of the content on category theory before this is written in very kind of hard to read textbooks that, you know, really for someone who's beginning at the subject um, is not very easy at all, especially if you don't know enough about what category theory is about to sort of have the motivation to look at it. But thank goodness for the work of Bartosz Malowski, who has made these resources and made it possible to access this kind of category theory. And I've tried to kind of repeat this formula of um, making category theory accessible on this channel with my series, Category Theory for Beginners. And I always said, you know, if I could just inspire one other person um, to be as, to get as much interest out of this theory as I have, it will all be worth it, okay? Um, because it, for me, it's just been such a, a mind-blowing kind of subject. Um, you know, sometimes I can hardly believe how much easier it makes it to reason about particular things. I mean, it's obviously a hard subject to learn. I would say I've taken an enormous amount of time to try to learn category theory over the last few years. Um, but on the other side of a coin, um, the payoffs are absolutely profound. And saying that, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of great content in Bartosz Malowski's work, but me having a sort of more of a mathematical background as opposed to a computer programming background, I was interested in something to explain the more kind of mathematical content of category theory. And that's where I came across this book, Conceptual Mathematics by Levere and Chanel. So William Levere is one of the greatest mathematicians around at the moment. Um, and this is a book written to explain category theory for a kind of beginning undergraduate or advanced kind of high schooler and it basically starts at the beginning with you know what are functions and all the rest of it and ends up at sort of adjoint functors and it's not really written in a kind of heavy textbook kind of definition theorem proof kind of way it's written in a very intuitive sort of relatively easy to read way I mean saying that it's one of the hardest books I have to read. It's the kind of thing that, you know, will take you about three months of work, or at least it did for me. Uh, it took me about maybe two or three months of working on it every day to get through it, to do all the exercises and to get all the way through the book. But considering how profound the kind of things discussed in it are, um, it's remarkably easy to learn, okay? Because to be quite honest, by the time you've read this, if you've read it thoroughly, you'll have been exposed to most, well, a lot of the kind of hard ideas in mathematics as it's practiced today, okay? It, it really is that simple. It, it will expose you to so many different kinds of things and give you so many kind of ways of compressing uh, information. And so I loved that book and it really inspired me to learn more category theory. And that's when I got into this book here, elementary categories, elementary toposes, okay? Um, so this is more of a kind of textbook style and it sort of goes into category theory again 
it starts with very few kind of prerequisites but this is and this is actually a lot harder than Levere's book but it sheds so much light on the like exactly how category theory is laid out and works towards these just absolutely profound ideas about topos theory and the Mitchell Benavau language which really give you a kind of new foundation to think about things like um, structured sets and logic and mathematics in general and like it's all done from this book which you know rather than pretty much all of the rest of the content apart from maybe these two that I've discussed explain mathematics as if everything's made out of sets but this book really lets you break out of this kind of set theory box that most mathematicians live in because it teaches you topos theory and basically the kind of profound landscape of alternative kind of generalizations of set theory which, which are available which I think ultimately helps one to sort of see mathematics in a much less kind of material centered kind of point of view um anyway so that's it that's a few of my favorite books um so yeah I, I just basically want to say again thank you so much um for your attention and I hope you continue to enjoy the content on this channel.